How we doing, Matt? You all ready? Okay, we and we're live. Welcome back. Uh, yes. Yeah, so this is uh, what are we on session? Session seven, I think. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, there are handouts um, throughout the room. There should be also a handout for people online um, down in the the show notes. I guess is what they call it. Um, in our study of Hebrews. So let me, uh, let me say a prayer, and then we'll jump in together. Uh, so let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for, uh, for this day. We thank you for um, the gift of study and time to reflect. We also thank you, though, Lord, for fellowship and friendship that encourages us and um, provokes us to try to follow after you more ardently and to love one another more deeply. We pray that you are with us now as we learn these things together again in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay. All right. Welcome. Yes. The more the merrier, right? So we're a little low today because of uh, some of the weather, but um, so we are, as I said, session seven, and we're up into chapter four of... Um, uh, the book of Hebrews. Um, I think it's be, it'd be safe to say that the first two chapters kind of hang together. I gave a, re a recapitulation of that material, um, and you got uh, in that session, in those sections, chapters one and two, um, a pretty strong um, affirmation of Jesus's identity, but in a way that I think we could describe as complex. Um, I've used the language of, we've, we've used the language of dialectic, we've used the language of paradox, and what we're talking about here is that what you get in the opening section of chapter one is some of the most highly exalted language that we find to use to describe who Jesus is, um, right? The, 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 the very icon of God uh, we get all kinds of sonship language, the necessity to d differentiate uh, Jesus off from those who might be confused with Jesus, and, and those would be, at least initially from this angle, uh, Yahweh's other associates, we might say, um, which are the angels. And, of course, we hear that Jesus is, of course, even superior to the angels. Then, conversely, this is the paradoxical part, we hear... Um, strong affirmations of Jesus's humanity, right? His identification with us in suffering. Um, and so that those first two chapters, in a way, establish Jesus's bona fides, and we might say bona fides for what? And I think it's the overarching aim of much of the letter to be a priest, to be a mediator. And a mediator, in a sense, is someone who stands between two parties. And that's really what a priest was. So the, op, you know, kind of the operating assumption, I think, or the criteria that the author is operating with is an ancient understanding of priest. We don't really hear that in a way until we get actually into the material uh, today. Today you will hear the author actually reference what is a priest, and they're operating again from an ancient perspective. Uh, we then turn to chapters, uh, chapter 3 through... Uh, uh, four, and I'll come back to that material. First, though, I want to offer to you, um, in part because this is a big theme, this is something that priests often preside at, or at least uh, in the ancient world they were um, closely associated with, and that was sacrifice, sacrificial language, the image of sacrifice. 
So I wanted to start with what is a sacrifice and what does it mean to you to make a sacrifice? And we're not talking here, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying you have to go out and kill a squirrel or anything or any of that. So, but you, you and I, we use the language of sacrifice every day and we carry certain kinds of meanings with that. So I wanted to give you an opportunity to discuss that. So maybe the, the, these two, two person tables, you guys can combine or some of you can combine to have a more robust conversation and I'll come back in a few minutes and we'll jump in. All right.
So about 30 more seconds. Okay, I want to invite everybody back um, and I gave, you, gave you a couple of questions. There's a mic over here. So I uh, just wanted to hear what you talked about, uh, thoughts that you had. What is a sacrifice and what does it mean to you to make a sacrifice? There was some good chatter. Okay, all right, good. We had a very good discussion. Um, we started talking about the sacrifice of, um, for example, if you're watching television right now in this series, Masters of the Air, these airmen that um, flew over Germany, like 50% of them were killed. They knew they weren't coming back and um, they did this for someone else. So we thought in terms of sacrifice where you give something valuable that um, it's not for you, but it's for someone else. Okay. All right. Masters of the Air, which is on Apple TV. Oh, it's Apple on TV, Apple TV Plus. I think. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. But it's incredible. It's amazing. Yeah. Incredibly oh, terrifying. Yeah, I mean, thinking about also, there are parts in it, if you haven't seen it, about the Tuskegee Airmen. And again, the sacrifice they made for a country that really had wronged them and that they were going back to, but there are many scenes in which these airmen talk about the sacrifice they're making and, and why they're making it for somebody else. Mm. All right, thank you. Other thoughts, other pieces? We have some other tables over here. I know the microphone feels a long way away, but it's not. Look at this. All the way over. I know I could tempt somebody. It's the bottom one. Okay. You said it was on. Uh, <laughs> um, we talked about, you know, we asked whether tithing was a sacrifice um, because it sort of matches what the Old Testament sacrifices were part of their tithe. Um, we talked about um, ego, sacrificing our egos to put some other people first. Um, what else? Yeah, I think, I mean, tithing is a great example to, I think typically we wind up somehow or another entwining our ideas of sacrifice that only with blood or death. And what we find actually in the Old Testament is that there are many, many, many other kinds of sacrifices that have nothing whatsoever to do with the shedding of blood. And I think what it leads us to is this vision that sacrifice has to do with setting something aside for another purpose, right? I mean, you can sacrifice for your children, right? You can sacrifice for members of your family. You can sacrifice your ego. You can set aside some of your money for your church, et cetera. All those have, I think, an element 
uh, that, that is connected to the, this idea of sacrifice. And, of course, the example that you guys brought up as well would obviously also be a good one. Um, all right, well, let's, let's go ahead and we'll jump in together. We do have a fair amount of material. And uh, even though I don't have as many people here to interrupt me constantly, no, I'm just teasing. I actually love that part. Um, oh, oh, we already have a question. No, was that a joke? That was, okay, all right. That's right, Jeff Pope's not here. Where are you, Jeff? They probably felt like they couldn't make it over. It was, it was, a, it was a close call. I mean, it's a, is, maybe he might be online. Um, so we had, I just, just for a moment, I had kind of walked us through. I had, I'm, I had actually forgotten I had this question for you to talk about, which is why I was starting to do the uh, replay of everything. So chapters one and two, um, establishing Jesus's bona fides in many ways to help us understand how Jesus is a high priest, a mediating figure, um, identify with Yahweh, identifies with us. Um, in the section, particularly uh, chapter two, I think especially, um, a significant emphasis on Jesus' suffering. Uh, and this was, of course, a big question, and I think it continues to be a big question, depending on the way that we think about what it means that Jesus suffered. Uh, because in the ancient world, to suffer, um, and in particular, uh, to die the way that Jesus did die, was to be associated with shame. And, uh, and rather than backing away from the shameful death, um, uh, Hebrews leans into it in order to understand that, in fact, it is through the Jesus' identification with, with basically human abasement that this is, in fact, part of the, the, the tool, the power by which God is going to overthrow uh, the enemies that withstand or stand against God. Um, at the end, then, of that, of chapter 2, um, and because I think, uh, maybe, maybe we could say because rhetorically it works very well because one of the things I'll put up here probably in a, a, another lesson is to show you that there's an interesting pattern in Hebrews of exposition and exhortation. There are sort of sections of exposition, explanation, and then there's sections of like, you, you know, exhortation, don't turn away, don't do this, don't do that. So as we turn then into chapters three to ch three into the first half of chapter four, we're kind of moving into an exhortation section there. And we're still though playing out of this uh, Jesus as identifying um, with either God or us. We've already heard Jesus as identified with Yahweh superior to the angels, now we hear about Jesus identified with us and yet superior to Moses, right? So this section works very well. Jesus is superior to Moses because he's a son and not simply a servant. Um, and as I mentioned here, is a true mediator uh, uh, who accrues more honor and glory because of his faithfulness unto death. Um, and he's the one to whom we should look. Um, the reason, though, that this material works especially well for exhortation is because of who Moses had to deal with, which was, for this author, the wilderness generation. And this is a generation of folks who are resistant in the way that the author wants to play with this material. And the reason, of course, is uh, to say something like, these folks beheld the glory of God working through Moses and the Exodus experience. They heard, in other words, they heard the gospel is the way that uh, the author operates. Um, and yet they didn't hear it, hear it. They turned away. And so the warning, of course, is to hear and not to turn away, but rather to turn towards. So uh, we should learn from these past examples, right? Uh, Moses' followers rebelled, hardened their hearts, not able to enter into God's promised rest. Um, the, the, the author, preacher, who, well, however it is we think about this text of Hebrews, and I think we've mentioned that it might have actually been an early sermon, is clearly adept at uh, rabbinic interpretive methods. And one of those methods is to pick up a term 
um, and to bring it into contact to, in a certain verse and to bring it into contact with, with that same term in another verse in order to open up a possible different way of meaning, right? So promised land or entering God's rest clearly is rooted in the Genesis account, but it's also talks about the promised land, and it also seems to talk about something even greater, right? And that's something even greater that we talked about was God's own life, that to enter into God's rest in, a, in some sense is to enter into God's way of being. So it's more than simply entering into the promised land. There's something else there that's being imagined. So uh, in addition then to this, right, uh, this warning Right is is Jesus's followers need to avoid falling away, and to hear that living voice which speaks today, right? And we hear the language of today. Do not now, today, today. That was uh, done a couple of different times in those first three or so chapters. And the living voice that we hear, and this is at the very end. I didn't really. Um, I don't know if I did it enough justice, but it was this final section in chapter four before we turn to today where we hear about the word of God is living and active, right? Able to pierce, right? Able to divide between spirit and soul, to, to pierce the body, etc. If that word of God is simply an abstract notion, I think that passage is pretty terrifying in a way. And we talked a little bit about that. But if we think about the broader sensibility of this letter, which is that actually the word of God is another way of designating Jesus. And if it's Jesus we're talking about, who's able to see into who we are, and it's the same Jesus who, who knows what it means to be weak, who knows what it means to suffer, which we're going to hear about now literally in just the next few verses, then I think it becomes much, much less terrifying and much more in a way comforting that God can see that that part of us and behold that part of us even those parts of us that we can't seem to see or behold so uh, that is a recapitulation then now we turn to material chapter 4 that moves us up into about 510 or so which I'm hoping that we'll get through today it's more exposition aimed and it is especially attuned to the question of Jesus as high priest so can I get a volunteer who's willing to open, read us this initial opening short passage? I'm going to have several passages here for folks to read, so. Okay. We'll do it 14 through 16. Uh, yes. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. So this is essentially a statement um, that we're going to have unpacked as we move through the rest of the materials. We've already talked about the fact that um, there were different messianic expectations. And I think I mentioned this uh, during our first session together in terms of the background. Um, we might call them clusters of expectations that were kind of would have been floating around. The two of the most prominent, certainly the most prominent more than likely is of course the Davidic kingly um, expectation, right? That the Messiah would in some way or another uh, uh, fulfill the hopes of Israel in terms of uh, the kingly uh, Davidic line. Now, we, as we read through the New Testament, we find that they, Jesus' life, way of being, etc., fulfills that, but in a way that oftentimes was not expected, right? Another, though, pretty prominent theme, but one that really is only addressed in this book, in the New Testament, is the theme of Jesus as high priest, or, an, or Messiah as high priest. And so what I wanted to do was just to pause. Um, I've got some uh, quotes here, some materials here. And essentially, just to glance to the side is kind of the idea, so that you see these are the texts. These are, uh, this is an example of some of the texts that would have been operative 
and important in that regard. So I have one that comes out of the um, what eventually we would consider to be kind of canonical literature, Zechariah. This is one of the prophets. Um, and then we have another that comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls. Uh, so the Qumran community would have used that one. And, the, and I just give these to you so you can see how this is, this is, all, this is at play everywhere, even though we don't hear as much about this typically uh, in the New Testament. So can I have a volunteer who's willing to read maybe the Zechariah chapter 3 text? Okay. Um, can you speak it into the, yeah, thank you. Then he showed me the high priest, Joshua, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. And the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, O Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was dressed with filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. And to him he said, see, I have taken your guilt away from you, and I will clothe you with festal apparel. And I said, let them put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him with the apparel. And the angel of the Lord was standing by. Then the angel of the Lord assured Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, if you will walk in my ways and keep my requirements, then you shall rule my house and have charge of my courts, and I will give you the right of access among those who are standing here. Now listen, Joshua high priest, you and your colleagues who sit before you, for they are an omen of things to come. I'm going to bring my servant the branch, for on the stone that I have set before Joshua, on a single stone with seven facets, I will engrave this inscription, says the Lord of hosts, and I will remove the guilt of this land in a single day. On that day, says the Lord of hosts, you shall invite each other to come under your vine and fig tree. So, I think this is just a, it's just a great text. Um, Elgin's looking at me like, what? Um, and I'm not going to, we're not, I, I'm not providing it so that I can give you sort of exposition of it, but I want you to see that there, there are these texts that are floating around in which a high priestly figure is a part of the final end of days, a sort of messianic figure. In the Zechariah one, you see actually both. You see both a high priestly figure and then what potentially could have been a kingly figure, which is the branch. And of course, the interesting you know, sort of background piece as well is that, I mean, Jesus, the name Jesus is the Aramaic form of Joshua. So uh, to hear this kind of Joshua language again and again. So you can kind of see that. Now, the, the next text, the 11, 11 Q Melchizedek, text. This comes from the Dead Sea Scrolls, and this is a great example of the use of the um, image of Melchizedek as a high priestly figure. So if I could get another volunteer who will be willing to read that material, I'd appreciate that. This is starting as for? Yes. And as for what he said, Leviticus 25, 13, in this year of jubilee, you shall return each one to his prospective property, as is written, um, Deuteronomy 15.2. This is the manner of effecting the release. Every creditor shall release what he lent to his neighbor. He shall not coerce his neighbor or his brother when the release for God has been proclaimed. Its interpretation for the last days refer to the captives about whom he said in Isaiah 16, 61, 1, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And he will make their rebels prisoners and of the inheritance of, thank you, Me Melchizedek. 
Melchizedek, thank you. Um, I've seen that before, I've never said it. I skip <laughs> over it. Um, and they are the inheritance of Melchizedek, who will make them return. He will proclaim liberty for them, to free them from the debt of all their iniquities. And this will happen in the first week of the Jubilee, um, which follows the nine Jubilees. And the Day of Atonement is the end of the 10th Jubilee, in which atonement will be made for all the sons of God and for the men of the lot of Melchizedek. And on the heights he will declare in their favor according to their lots, for it is the time of the year of grace for Melchizedek to exalt in the trial the holy ones of God through the rule of, ju of judgment, as is written about him in the Songs of David, who said in Psalms 18.21, Elam will stand up to the assembly of Elam, El, isn't it? El, that's um, right. El, in the midst of the gods he judges. And about him, he said, Psalms 7, 8, and 9, about, um, above it, um, return to the heights. God will judge the peoples. As for what he said, Psalms 82, 2, how long will you judge unjustly and show partiality to the wicked? Selah. Its interpretation concerns Bila? Belial. Thank you. In the spirit of his lot, who were rebels, all of them, turning aside from the commandments of God to commit evil. But Melchizedek will carry out the vengeance of God's judgments on this day, and they shall be, they shall be freed from the hands of Bilal and from the hands of all the spirits of his lot. To his aid shall come all the gods of assembly. This is the day of peace for which God spoke of old through the words of Isaiah the prophet, who said, Isaiah 52, 7, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, of the messenger of good who announces salvation, um, saying to Zion, Your God reigns. Okay, there is so much interesting stuff in that passage. I wish we could like spend the whole day just talking about that, but we're not going to. Um, I really just wanted to show you. So this is this is a Jewish text produced by a Jewish sectarian group, the Essenes. They're the ones that are typically um, associated with producing uh, the Dead Sea Scrolls. And what we see is that this is clearly a messianic text. Right, an expectation of a messianic figure who's going to come at the end of, thing, of, of time, who's going to function as Yahweh's instrument of working out kind of the final judgment. And this figure is designated Melchizedek. And then there's all this interesting other stuff about Jubilee and about like language that you know, would evoke to a certain extent, I think, in my mind, some of the things that we see, at least in Jesus's ministry. So um, nothing here fits perfectly. That's not the point of this. It's simply to show you that there are other Jewish groups for whom these are live questions. And this, I think, helps to explain why this is a live question um, also for the author uh, of the book of Hebrews. If you want to use that. Would this be before or after Jewish uh, Jesus? Uh, well, the Zechariah or... text is obviously before. Right. But the the Dead Sea, I, you know, that's a good question. They're typically placed in the time of um, around, but I don't know precisely on 11Q Melchizedek. This text, though, I will say has gotten a tremendous amount of attention in the scholarship um, in terms of. Yeah, do we have a question? Ah, so uh, so Matt, um, who his girlfriend is a former LDS, I think, is that right? Yeah, so former LDS Mormon, and you were saying that they have a very strong priesthood Melchizedek component, yeah. Interesting. Interesting. That puts us about eighteen hundred or so years later, but yeah, that's right. That's right. 
Okay. All right. Yeah, I just I think it's helpful sometimes to see these because then we we get a better sense of why why was this text produced? Um, it's the only one, of course, as I mentioned in the New Testament, that that really tries to work out the question of Jesus's priesthood. Um, uh, even though there are pla- other places where it's a little hinted at, you get a really careful workout. And so it may be that this author was aware, and this is one of the you know the, one of the uh, authorship, you know, kind of who was it that authored this? Was it someone who knew about the Essenes who was trying to address some of their concerns and say, hey? You guys are expecting this Melchizedek figure. Let me tell you about Jesus. You know, he's, he is, in fact, that one. So um, having said all that and having read uh, 14 through 16, which I think in a sense is sort of a, in a way, a kind of thematic statement of what's going to come all the way up into the middle of chapter 5 that's going to be worked out. Let's turn then for a couple things, a couple comments here. First question. Oh, yeah, question. Why did people need a intermediary? Well, I think there was an assumption in the ancient world, and there's, I mean, even now, uh, there's a certain kind of assumption about coming into contact with that which is beyond. Um, And uh, there are certainly texts uh, and uh, assumptions, I don't want to get too philosophical because one assumption is, of course, if you come into contact with God, you'll be swallowed up by the divine, right? Because the divine is so great, nothing can stand in its, uh, in its presence. And there are texts like that in the Old Testament, right? Of like, it's a fearful thing to come into the presence of God. Um, so that's probably some element of it. If you're asking me about the sort of ideology of priesthood, I don't think I can explain that. Um, but there's a basic sensibility of, of the, ne- the need for a mediator. Uh, and, and what you have, is certainly in the, in the Hebrew religion, in the religion of Israel, is you also have this component of mediating, uh, mediatorship. You even have this component of mediatorship going back into, I mean, Abrahamic times to a certain extent in, in the sense that the patriarchs become kind of mediating figures. Um, but I think part of the argument of Hebrews is to show that no other mediator will do now, that there is only one mediator, and that one mediator is Jesus, who himself is, of course, God, divine, however one decides they're going to understand that, and human, fully human. So. That's about the best I can do. Thank you. Does the Holy Spirit supersede the need for a mediator? No, I don't. Well, I don't know. I mean, it kind of depends. I mean, I don't know if you're asking me a normative question or a descriptive question. If you're asking me to describe how... Well, I would say the early Christians were nervous about the Spirit. Um, And I don't mean the average Christian. I mean the Christian leaders. (laughs) Right, we, we just finished going through the book of Acts, right? And what was one of the central dynamics of the book of Acts? That the Spirit is doing all this stuff to mess up things, and it's really hard to, like, you know, they want us to welcome Gentiles? I mean, that, that kind of stuff. And I think there's a kind of reticence. If, you, if we track this up into sort of Christian history, there's a real reticence to reflect on the Spirit in some sense, because I think there's, number one, caution of, well, where, is, where does the spirit end and the creature begin? Like, we don't know exactly. We know that God is in our midst, interacting with us, even inside of us, but precisely where the dividing line is is difficult. But number two, um, wh- how do we discern between the spirits? If you have the Spirit and you say one thing and it completely contradicts what I say and I have the Spirit, how do we discern between us? That's a sticky thing that any community has to kind of unfold, I think. So I think there's a kind of of reticence of some of that. Yes, and, and then yes, the Spirit, to a certain extent, certainly is a part of uh, the setting aside of mediatorship, but the spirit that's given to us is not just any spirit. It's not the spirit in general. It's not the spirit in vague. It's the spirit of 
Jesus. It's the spirit of the mediator. So there's no real around it necessarily. There's just a going through it kind of. Yeah. So the high priestly theme then, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Hebrews, uh, this is its unique contribution to the New Testament and, and, and to kind of early Christian reflection. And we just had these two texts, right, uh, where I talked about how there are all kinds of examples of uh, reflection on a sort of high priestly messianic figure. Um, again, one of the most important things, I think, about the book of Hebrews, and this, by the way, was something that the Protestant reformers could not get enough of, was to say, clearly, Jesus ends priesthood. He's the end of any priesthood. There shouldn't be priests, essentially. That's their argument. There can be pastors and ministers, but not priests, is, sort of the, is, is, is basically the way that Calvin, Luther, and others uh, read this. So uh, numerous examples in apocalyptic and second other, other second temple texts that you can see. Um, the two places I think that are especially important for the way that the book of Hebrews develops this is the section that we're getting ready to enter into and then another section that's going to start in chapter 7. So we're going to get kind of a big broad brush set of themes I think here. And then when we get into chapter 7, the author gives us a more detailed description of what, how they understand Jesus' priesthood or mediatorship to work. Uh, yes, so exposition of Jesus is great. And then the latter passage, again, focuses on the role that Jesus performed. So at the very beginning then here of, uh, first, uh, of uh, 4.14, we have the sense then, right? And basically, the sense then uh, unfolds out of verses 12 and 13 um, that we have would have just read. And that was, of course, a culmination um, of an exhortation section, right, where the author is saying, um, you know, it, do, not find, do not allow yourself to be put in the same position as the wilderness generation, which essentially, I think the idea is that um, it wasn't just one sin. It was sort of, it was sort of, over time, not attending to the divine voice, so that then the heart becomes hardened, so that when God does in fact call you, you can't hear. Is sort of the way that the system, I think, the way that this author is imagining um, uh, the problem that happened for the wilderness generation. The word of God, as it talks about, is a word that um, can penetrate. There's no hiding essentially from God. That's kind of the part of the argument. It's able to discern that which is well beyond human beings. And it puts us in a, profound, a situation of profound vulnerability. And I did uh, mention to you there's the, kind of that word uh, that's utilized there um, about being ba laid bare and made naked, essentially, before God, which um, could be terrifying depending on the God, you know, if you're talking about being on an operating table and there's just some blaring light and kind of vague figures moving around you, but if you're talking about being seen by Jesus, that's a very different image, right? And so that's why I would argue that that's a better understanding in a sense or a better way of interpreting that particular passage that the word of God there refers not to God's speech in abstract, not even scripture in abstract, but rather the living word, it, who is Jesus, who himself knows what it means to be human in a very profound way, which is something that we've already heard, and now we're going to hear even more, right? We've heard, we hear this already also in verse, starting in verse 15. Now, verse 14, though, <laughs> Uh, is full of uh, significant content, um, right? Jesus is described first and foremost as a great high priest. That would have been familiar to the hearers um, who we kind of widely assume are Jewish Christians. Um, they would have known about the economy uh, that kind of worked itself out in the temple that you have um, essentially a priestly apparatus, and at the very top is a 
high priest chosen once, um, uh, I think it's kind of once a year. I don't there might have been longer terms or not, but um, but this is the title of the Jewish high priest that's now um, fastened uh, or um, attributed to Jesus himself. Um, he is a great price, high priest who has passed through the heavens. Now, this language of pass through the heavens certainly could mean um, a multi-tiered view of the universe. I'm sure that that's probably partly the way that this figure operated. But I think the, the primary thing is not whether or not there are multiple tiers to the heavens. It is rather that, that, that Jesus, in his priestly work, in a sense, does what the high priest does. And what does the high priest do? They walk through the different tiers of the temple to go and in, enter into God's presence. And so to walk through the tiers of heaven, in a sense, is much like a sort of heavenly version of what we see on the earth. Of course, the argument from the author of the Hebrews is that it's actually the inverse. What's happening on the earth is, is a mere shadow of what actually happens in the heavens, in the spirit world. So it really is primarily uh, an echoing of the activity of the high priest, especially on the day of Han, uh, Yom Kippur. What happens, and we're going to hear more about this as we get up into chapter 7, where we're going to kind of get a little bit more detail what does it mean that Jesus has kind of trans, tra, moved through these realms? What does it mean that he brings himself, his offering? What does it mean, et cetera, for us as well? So as I mentioned here, the high priest would pass through the outer courts into the Holy of Holies. And in the same way, this is what Jesus has done on our behalf. This is what Jesus ha either has done or is doing. Um, as I mentioned here, unlike the high priest... Jesus' passage into God's presence ensures that others can also come in, um, which uh, is not the case. This is one of the reasons why the earthly model of priestly approach to the divine um, is not able to accomplish what Jesus is able to accomplish. Because what are we going to hear at the very end of this little densely packed set of verses? that you and I can also approach the throne of grace. And what is the throne of grace? It is the holy of holies. It is the place where no one could go for fear of death, except the great high priest. But what Jesus has done is made a, a path for all, essentially, to be able to enter into that. Um, we can kind of skip that last little part. He's, he is titled here, right? Since then, we have a great high priest who's passed through the heavens, who's... who's who's blazed a trail, essentially, who's been a pioneer of our faith, which we already heard about. Um, Jesus, the Son of God, right? Here is a title that also would have been familiar, but it would have been familiar well beyond uh, the confines of Israel or, or, or Jewish um, expectation because the emperors were called sons of God. They had it imprinted on their coins. It's a political title, it's a royal title, so it's not just a kind of ontological uh, Trinitarian title, which we, what we might you know, be tempted to assign it. It's actually a title of, about Jesus as both priest and king, essentially. Um, right? We're getting kind of coded language uh, around his kingship. This echoes Psalm 2, Psalm 110. As I mentioned there, um, Augustus Caesar uh, among many, was considered a son of the gods. So, effectively, what we're starting to get now is Jesus as priest king. Um, so, there's a kind of entwining, we might say, of these different messianic expectations that, uh, that, that, that Jews and others would have held. One of which we've talked about, the Davidic, right? The sense that Jesus or the Messiah was going to come from the line of David, was going to fulfill the hopes for a new king, um, a new kingdom. The other of which, of course, that we read today, the expectations and hopes for a cleansed temple and a new priesthood headed by a new high priest. Right? All those meet, in a sense, is what the, kind of the author is saying uh, in the person of Jesus. So the priest king. So Jesus then... As this figure, as I say here, because Jesus, the one who shared in our weakness, is enthroned, 
we know now that we also can approach God's throne. So one radically like us um, has um, not only traversed the earthly path, but they have traversed literally into God's presence. And now this all assumes, we don't, I'm not saying that you have to assume this, but I am saying that from the perspective of the author, their assumption is that what happened in the temple, like in Jerusalem, was a kind of mimic of what was happening in the heavens. That was what made it effective in their mind, all right? So there are, the argument is that Jesus has now fulfilled this. And in a sense, it's not necessary anymore, right? That this is part of the argument. And so this is one of the reasons why it's not clear, is this, was this uh, Hebrews, was this produced before the destruction of the temple or after the destruction of the temple? What is clear is that whatever Christianity is going to be, it's not going to be temple-centric. It doesn't need a temple anymore, right, effectively. It doesn't need a priesthood. It needs only Jesus, effectively. That's kind of the argument. So what's the confession that we have to hold? We Let us hold fast to our confession. And here, I think we need to just be reminded that confession is not simply about mere belief. It is about loyalty. We are, remember, the author has been going on and on. Don't turn away. Don't lose your way. Don't, don't become hardened so you can't hear God's voice call to you. Um, rather, be supple, have your ear open, maintain your confession, right? So this is not about, like, maintaining your five points of Calvinism or whatever, five points of Arminius, I don't know, whatever six, seven, eight points of theology that you need. Um, it has really to do with loyalty to Jesus, loyalty to God, all right, so we have, I think, exhausted verse 14. I feel very good and confident about that. So let's move on to verses 15 and 16. <laughs> so with verse 15, then, we start to get now these really, I mean, I just, it's hard to say these, these are the kinds of texts uh, that are worth sitting with um, in this book, because this book is very dense, Right? You've, and I'm doing my best, Tom. I'm, I'm trying. But, but there are these, these places where, like, listen to this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses. But we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, but didn't fold, right? Yet was without sin. That's the, that's the end. So we have someone who can profoundly identify with us and the difficulty of what it means to be human, what it means to follow God's will in this life, the kind of extended experience of something like that. So that's verse 15, right? Um, we've already heard that Jesus is like us in every way, going back into chapter 2. Now we hear it again as a kind of encouragement because Jesus is like us in every way, we should be encouraged also to be able to enter into God's presence as we follow behind Jesus, not on our own value, or on our own worth, but because of what Jesus himself has done, what he's opened up. Um, he was tested, right? And we've talked a little bit about the idea of testing um, in the ancient world. Uh, and I think the basic imagery here is the imagery we, that we might pull out of metallurgy of refining and testing precious metals. Right? The reason that you put them under fire is to get the dross and the impurities out and to prove the, the fullness or, the, or the, the value or whatever it is the case may be. So there's a basic commonplace belief in the ancient world that virtue faithfulness, etc., is revealed under duress, right? The person, and we hear this, right? Our, your character shows up, who you really are, shows up in some ways in situations of duress. And I think it's that same basic idea uh, that's being kind of talked about here. Jesus has been in and through situations of genuine duress. And this, these are the kind of verses that also raise all kinds of very interesting, profound theological questions, which is, 
could Jesus have sinned or not? And for some, they're like, well, yes, he could have sinned. Otherwise, the testing doesn't make any sense because it's not a real test. For others, no, of course, he could never have sinned because he's God's son. But you can have those kinds of arguments based on a text like this and a few others actually in all in the book of Hebrews. So uh, that they don't resolve this here, but we can simply say Jesus is re- testing result, results in the revelation that he is without sin because he withstands the test, right? He's not faithless, he's faithful. And therefore, he has sympathia. He has a, an ability to identify with us, right? Um, it opens him outward towards others. Um, this actually is an important point that I do want to highlight, which is um, there is a commonplace belief that um, testing reveals the quality of your commitment to something, but it is not a commonplace belief that that testing will open you up to the weaknesses of others. That is something that is unique and uniquely stated here, even if it's done so in a somewhat indirect fashion. Jesus' testing opens him outward towards others because the typical idea would be you, you guys also need to withstand the test. But the truth is that we typically can't, right? And that's not even the, up for discussion here, at least not in the form that Jesus had. All right, so then ver- turning then to verse 16, um, A, I believe. Yes, I guess A. Oh my, oh, my. And then I've got an entire thing on 16B. I need to cut this down, I think. Um, so verse 16a, let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness, right? Because we have one who has traversed the heavens, um, on our behalf, has made a path for us, is like us in every way, but did not sin. We now know that we can also, uh, approach, uh, the throne of grace. So rather than Jesus is suffering, uh, being a, a, a source of embarrassment, it's actually the doorway that allows us also to enter in because it's the, it is the expression of God's identification with us, of solidarity with us, right? That's what his death and his testing uh, reveals. So um, it is the suffering Messiah, in a sense, who stands before God, who is enthroned um, and we'll get enthronement language a little bit later. When one could simply say something like, as I mentioned here, that, that Jesus is faithful unto death. Um, and it is his faithfulness in all of its complexity um, that is uh, the source. So... Jesus' enthronement then and his high priestly work, as I mentioned here, on our behalf, it opens up a pathway for us also to approach God through prayer. Obviously, that's what's being envisioned here. This is not about necessarily about having visionary experiences, though I'm sure that might happen as well, but it's really about the experience of prayer. And we can approach God with confidence to receive mercy and grace. Grace, um, of course, is this act of liberating us from the fear of death. And I think one of the operating assumptions um, that much of the New Testament has is that the fear, it is our fear of death, um, which even today we still have, that causes us to often do things that we might not otherwise do or that causes us to turn away. From God, right? Um, again, those moments of duress, right? And the, what's the most, what's the extremity of duress? Death, right? Um, potentially. So, uh, liberation from that fear, that is the, that's what grace in a sense does. And mercy, right? That God would remember our sins no more. And this, of course, is going to come back in chapter 8. Um, I, we could have picked up, I suppose, on some of the Hebrew meanings of this, uh, particularly the mercy one for God's hesed 
um, and hesed is a, it's a love and a compassion that oftentimes is not translated mercy, but steadfast love. Um, and that comes out of the gut, that God's steadfast love, um, which is something that, that maintains relationship, even when that relationship is broken. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in the time of need. So the right time, the today moment, right? When, when we need it, we can find what we need. Um, God's timing is not necessarily our timing, of course. But when we approach the throne, we emulate Jesus. And what that means is that we expect God to be faithful in God's own timing. What do I mean by that? I mean in a sense that Jesus cries out for God to deliver him from the cross, right? God does deliver Jesus from the cross, but only after he has to go through the experience of the cross and death, and then he is delivered. That's what I mean by that sense of timing. We, it's not always what we expect. So uh, I've already kind of actually brought this up. Could Jesus have sinned? And the tradition, again, uh, the Christian tradition is divided on this question. Some argue that the humanity that Jesus um, assumed is fully like us. It's sinful flesh, sinful humanity. For others, it's sinless flesh. Uh, I'm not going to go into the metaphysics of this. I feel like I'm already kind of blowing your minds as it is. So let me stop there, and, uh, and we'll pause for a minute over our three verses that we have fully unpacked. I think we'll get we'll we'll kind of things will kind of hum along a little bit more in just in just a moment. I think we'll see. Uh, comments, questions, objections, long breaths. An all-knowing God doesn't remember anymore. Um. Well, I mean, this is what eight twelve says. Yeah, uh, God remembers our sin. That's more than likely. That's simply a euphemism, um, or or um, a, a, not a euphemism, but a an idiom that simply means that they are no longer front and center. They're no longer how God regards us, et cetera. Gonna give it back to you. If and is, Jesus is You God. never get up to ask a question. This is pretty. Well, it, I've got kind of two. First, okay. um, Jesus is God, and God can do anything. So, of course, Jesus could sin, but Jesus chooses never. And that's the lesson, in some ways, to strengthen ourselves through Christ so that we also choose not. Right. Correct? Well, that's okay. one, that is definitely one of the readings, which is, or one of the positions. And the one I certainly identify more with, well, yeah, he, part of the drama is that he has to, that, that, that the son of God experiences the full range of human experience, including the possibility of really being genuinely tempted. Mm -hmm. um, now, like I said, about half of the tradition rejects, <laughs> would reject that. Okay. So, yeah. You had a second question? Well, the other one, um, through the years, and especially now as I'm old, um, I don't seem to be around people who are afraid of death. They're afraid of dying. They're afraid of the process. But um, even some younger people that I've been around, you know, mm -hmm. who have chronic pain and other things, it's like, where are you? You know, where are you, death? Where is this peace? Um, so I don't know. Pass that on. I think that's fair. I mean, I, I feel the same way, um, oddly. I think when my son died, um, whatever fear of death kind of went with him. Um, I'm, not, I'm not looking forward to the process of dying, as you said. But um, 
I do think, though, there is a kind of assumption at work in Scripture, at least, that our fear of the unknown, which is death that would be the great unknown, right, often drives us to do terrible things, right? Um, like if we, I'm going to risk a political statement right now, but some of the things that are happening immigration-wise, I understand there's lots of positions on this, but at least one component is a fear of we don't know who these people are, right? So that's what I mean by that sense of that fear of death can oftentimes drive us to do things. And I, and I do think scripture kind of operates with that. It would be interesting to know, though, because the average lifespan at this time is mid-30s. You know, and I think for women it's younger because uh, childbirth was so dangerous. So with death so ever-present, you know, are people really afraid of it or not? That, that's a good question, I think. Yeah. Um, as a physician, I've seen many people afraid of death. I think it's fear of the unknown. It's fear of separation. It's a lot of things. What your, happens to your body. So... It yeah, kind of depends. It, yeah, it probably know. depends on the death. Like, yeah. I, like I think about my mom's death, and my mom died at 67. Her birthday was Saturday, so that's one of the reasons why she's on my mind. And uh, she got cancer. We didn't really have cancer in the family tree. Um, and probably the first part of that process was filled with fear. There was a lot of fear. And as, and as she went into the process of actively dying, there was a fair amount of unfinished business, you know, in life, in relationships. Um, I think by the end, she was very much not afraid, you know. But as she was going through the process, you know, you had to work through the fear of the, like you said, you know, the unknown. The, so, yeah. A little bit more on that. You know, when you see um, and kind of like watch a lot of historical things and some of this World War II stuff is um, people are reading about the massacre of, that Stalin in the 30s did to the Ukrainians and people were just dumped into mass graves or maybe what's happened to the r remains of Native Americans. But I think people have a fear of, uh, of how what happens to their body, and it's why so many people, I think, still have difficulty, at least as I've encountered, um, as I worked in the cancer field, with what to do with their body after, whether they are cremated, whether they are you know, embalmed, and there's different traditions around that. To me, I think a lot of that is a deep-seated fear of death. I don't know how it's expressed in different people, but how reassuring to know that grace liberates you from the fear of death, whatever form it may take in a person. Yeah, I, I think this is a fascinating conversation. I wish I could continue it. Well, when you were talking about it, I was thinking like the ancient Roman practice, which actually is pretty common among many ancient peoples, and even maybe we might even say today, of visiting the graves you know, and as in, a, in some ways communing or being in contact with the ancestors. And I wonder if there's a part of that clearly of a belief about something more, something beyond, but there's also something that is uh, being communicated to the people who are alive that you're not gonna be forgotten when you die, which is a, a part of the, because that is a question of erasure where do we go? Will we be remembered, right? So, before I get too emotional, let's go forward. <laughs> uh, can I get a volunteer who's willing to read our next verses? Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf 
to offer gifts and sacrifices for sin. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward, since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins, as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So here we have uh, the op- right and the operative criteria, in a sense, that has been determining the author, speaker, all on the way as they've been trying to make the case that Jesus Himself is a high priest, is a priest. Obviously, the the great caveat is in the middle, right? Jesus doesn't need to offer sacrifices for Himself but he offers them rather on behalf of others, et cetera. So we'll, we'll kind of unpack this. Um, I think we may wind up stopping with this particular passage. But So yes, yeah, so verses 1 through 4, this offers to us a catalog of priestly characteristics, at least the way these would be pretty commonplace for how people thought about what it meant to be a priest. And, and then I think more than likely... Um, even more specific in the Jewish world, right? How they thought about the high priest. Um, these are then going to be mapped onto the work that Jesus himself does in verses 5 through 10. So we're getting the catalog here, and then we're going to get in some ways how Jesus fulfills that in the next set of verses. So number one, <coughs> excuse me, is... Uh, priests are representatives, right, of the people. And therefore, in a sense, they have to come from the people. And we've already heard, right, we've already had established uh, Jesus' bona fides as one of us uh, in a very, very strong fashion. Um, The work that they do, as it says in verse 1, every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. So this gets us then to the divine things is the offering of gifts and sacrifices. Now the commentators are kind of divided. Are gifts and sacrifices, are they distinct things? The basic idea is that this is probably um, a phrasing that is meant to encapsulate all the work that a priest does, right? From beginning to end, essentially. Uh, so gifts and sacrifices could be used synonymously, or they could be simply see, be seen as kind of bookends to encapsulate the other. The, the key word, the, the main word, is not so much gifts and sacrifices, it's the work of offering. That's the key word here. So the key word is to offer. And this, I think, is helpful for us as we think about, well, what is a sacrifice? To offer something is to take it from one place and put it into another place in its most basic sense. That's the, the, the basic idea, um, at least in terms of the technical meaning here. So it has to do with the transference of something from one realm to another realm. And if we're talking here within a kind of religious realm, it would go from a profane to a sacred, um, or from a sec- we might use the language, I guess, of secular and sacred. Um, even if those are problematic categories. So the idea then, um, the, the, the work of giving gifts and, and offerings then does not have primarily to do with killing animals. It has rather to do with setting certain things aside for God. Right? That's the basic idea. And that's kind of what we're getting. That's what the author wants us to see is that in a sense, you and I are also supposed to continue to offer to God, but it's a bloodless sacrifice, right? That he wants us to move away from that idea because the one and only sacrifice has already been offered, and that was the life, the whole life of Jesus. So it doesn't have primarily to do with the preparation of the animal, but rather with its actual presentation into God's presence, which is what we mean by the sacred realm. So a priest is a person who comes from the people and whose primary job is to help the people bring a portion of who they are, whether we're talking about actual bits and pieces, and, and, and offer it to God, put it into God's presence for whatever purpose, 
Um, we don't get that uh, language yet uh, in terms of that. That at least is the assumption. Now, uh, moving then, again, the average priest into verses 2 and 3, and then 4. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and the wayward, since he himself is subject uh, to weakness. So ignorant and wayward. Um, again, uh, I'm kind of following uh, a couple of commentators here. But I think the idea here is that um, priests are particularly able to help people who sin on accident, essentially, is kind of the idea. Now, they, they, maybe they have a very... It, this is part of the problem of living 2,000 years later. <laughs> we have such different visions of what sin is. Um, and for some of us, every like if you're coming out of a Calvinist tradition, which is the tradition that shaped our church, almost everything you do is laced with sin. <laughs> At least that's what Calvin argued. Um, but in other traditions, like, say, a Methodist tradition, Wesley said, a sin is a conscious breaking of one of God's commandments, that you decide you're going to do it and you do it. It's not that you, you know, accidentally did something or whatever. It, you have to decide to do it. So that's what I mean by I, it's difficult for me to know exactly where all of us are coming from. But I do think this particular uh, author is operating with the idea of ignorant um, and in some ways then uh, moving away from the wilderness generation, um, which is, uh, I would say, problematic. We need to read this with another passage, probably. Because this high priest is human and subject to weakness, they also commit sins by ignorance. And therefore, they have to also offer um, on their behalf because of their ignorance. So uh, he's able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. The, the, another translation, which I think is a little bit more evocative, is clothed in weakness, in part because it kind of captures some of the robes that priests wear, um, all that kind of stuff. But uh, the NRSV UE uh, chose this one subject. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sin as well as those of the people. So because of the ignorant sins of the priest, uh, the, the, the offering is not only on behalf of the people, it's on behalf also of the priest um, himself. It's just typically going to be a male priest. We then get verse 4, and one does not presume to take this honor. In other words, you don't push yourself forward you have to be appointed to it. Um, so there's a certain kind of humility here. And that's what's also going to be brought forward in terms of Jesus and his humility. Um, it is his willingness to undergo suffering. So the mention then of Aaron is, uh, is going to set up for us um, one of these call vomers. And I mentioned to you before, this is one of those rabbinic techniques um, where the author creates a contrast in order to show that one is lesser and the other is greater. Um, Aaron, right? So as we say, and one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was, how much more so is it going to be the case with Jesus? That's what we're going to hear. right? So if Aaron had to be appointed, you know, and the Aaronic priesthood is kind of fading away, it couldn't accomplish what it was supposed to accomplish, only one person could go into God's presence, couldn't lead everyone else. How much more, though, does someone have to be appointed to do what Jesus did? That's kind of the logic, at least, of the, the passage. All right, I think we're going to stop here. Um, let me see what kind of comments or questions you might have. I know this is a dense material. I'm going to try not to make it as dense moving forward, um, but I can only do what the passage allows me to do. Yeah. I was laughing when it said that he will use the sacred pastor to deal with their weakness and that they were. What? Where it says that, that he will get the pastor to deal with their weakness and their weakness. Oh. 
No comment. Uh, <laughs> well, I'm, I'm, as, I'm as ignorant as wayward as anybody else in this room and anybody online. So, um, yeah, so we have a, a mic. Do we have other comments or questions or? We, we have a couple of uh, over here. First to, to Barb, and then you have a prayer request? Okay. Um, I just think it's, it's um, a beautiful text, especially to the Hebrew people as they're um, adjusting the change of um, following Christ. Um, they they still have their high priest, but I mean he's not really an intermediary because he's not between them and God because he is God, right? Um, and also, I think it's so comforting that to realize Jesus knows what our suffering is like. Yeah, I, I especially that last part resonates so deeply. Um, and the, there are these those passages in chapter two. Now in chapter four, I think there's another one in chapter six that um, Jesus really knows, you know, what it's like to be human, um, and that is deeply comforting, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, Diane Getch called us last night. Uh, Dave is in the hospital, and they can't figure out what's wrong. They have eliminated a stroke, but uh, their daughter and son flew out yesterday at three right. to be with them. So keep them in your prayers. We will. Yeah, Florida. I'll pray for them actually right now. was actually wondering, well, I talked to Matt just a second ago to ask him if Diane was on, on Zoom. Um, are there any questions from folks on Zoom? No? All right. Well, let's uh, say a prayer. We'll pray our way out, and we'll remember um, Diane and Dave um, as well and any other uh, folks that are on our hearts. Lord, we thank you that you are indeed able to identify with us in our weakness, in our suffering, in our struggles. And, Lord, I hope in all the other ways in which we're human. Your presence is needed and wanted, and we invite you in. Help us, O oh God, to be supple. Help our hearts to be open and our ears to be open so that we might hear the call to turn towards you and towards our neighbor in new and profound ways. We think especially today, O oh Lord, of the Getch family, of Diane and Dave and the children that you're with the physicians as they're trying to understand what is going on with Dave, that I pray also for him that he is comforted and um, he's not afraid, he's not gripped by fear, but rather senses your presence. And the same I pray for Diane as well. We pray for health and we pray for recovery, but we pray especially for your nearness in this time. Thank you, Lord, that you hear our prayers and that you answer them. We ask and pray all these things in your name.